Good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tahia Islam, and I'm a part of the education team here at the People's Forum. For those of us that are new to TPF, we are a political education and cultural center for internationalist working class movement building. Our physical space in New York City on Lenape land is open on Fridays uh, with new summer Hello. hours. Good evening. Good To Sorry about that, I had a double play. Um, but yeah, so visit us when we get our new summer hours open soon. And of course we still have our programming continued online. Uh, for those of you who are on Zoom, you can ask questions in the Q&A. And if you are on YouTube, you can post in the live chat. So welcome, welcome to our very first session of our 2021 series, histories of the working class in North America. This is a new series that brings researchers and scholars into conversation with organizers, students, and teachers engaged in working class and anti-racist struggles. We want to better understand North American working class life in order to learn lessons that can be applied to organizing today. Uh, the majority of us, no matter our level of education, have been taught to see history from the perspective of our exploiters, which obscures the real history, it obscures the good fights, and it forestalls future victories. Um, so for today's talk on women's organizing in the Appalachian South, we're very grateful to be joined by Dr. Jesse Wilkerson, who specializes in the histories of Appalachia and the South, modern America, women and gender, and labor and the working class. Her first book, To Live Here, You Have to Fight, How Women Led Appalachian Movements for Social Justice, traces the alliances forged in the grassroots movement led by women in the Appalachian, uh, led by women in the Appalachian South in the 1960s and 1970s. She shows how white Appalachian women acted as leaders and soldiers in a grassroots war on poverty and in the women's movement. Prior to this evening, a cohort of labor and tenor organizers, journalists of people's movements, cultural workers, and educators read chapters of this book and discussed the connections to their organizing struggles today. And that is a lot of who we have in the room now and who will be receiving some questions from later as well. So with that context and framing, I pass it over to Dr. Wilkerson for her talk. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much Tahia for that really generous um, introduction. And, and thanks also for doing so much work to organize, organize this event. So I wanna thank um, the People's Forum staff for making this happen. I wanna thank those of you who took the time to read my work. Um, it's always an honor to know that, that people find value in something that I wrote. So, um, and, and um, and also that people are interested in Appalachian women's history, which of course is really dear uh, to my heart. Um, so I know, like I said, that at least some of you have read a chapter from my book. And um, so what I thought I would do today is to first talk about how I came to the book topic. Um, so, you know, kind of a history of the book itself. And then I'll say a bit more about some of the major themes that I wrote about in the book. And then finally, I'll provide a few examples of women organizers who are featured in the book and just give you a sense of um, the broader scope of what I wrote. And, and then of course, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions and to hear your ideas. Um, so, um, so this is kind of in three parts. So part one is how I came to write this book. And um, so I grew up in East Tennessee um, on uh, lands that belong to the Cherokee outside of Knoxville and what used to be a pretty rural um, place, a pretty rural community. It's still very working class. And I grew up next to my grandmother, Faye. And I learned early on that she had grown up on a farm in the Tennessee Valley and her community and uh, that community was made up of extended family. They had been displaced like hundreds of working people when the Tennessee Valley Authority built dams to generate power to electrify the South. My grandmother always took great pride in that fact. Um, she knew that she was uh, in part, um, you know, part of the expansion of the New Deal and, and that um, when her family moved from that land that they were um, helping to provide electrification that provided more jobs to more people. 
But at the same time, I know that she and her family suffered a deep loss during that displacement. My great grandmother had been hired by the government to go door to door and to inform her neighbors that they needed to prepare to move, um, to give up their homes and their livelihoods. And so I can only imagine how difficult that job was. And then as my grandmother's family moved, her father became extremely ill and he died suddenly in the middle of the move, leaving a wife and four children. Um, so after that, my great grandmother um, had to give up her son under pressure from older men in the family. Uh, and he basically became a farmhand uh, uh, for them. And, and then she got a job as a school cook. She also managed to attain several dairy cows that she and her three daughters tended for extra income. Um, and I could say so much more about that family of women. Um, it, I've always kind of thought about them as like a Southern Appalachian version of the little women. Uh, but mainly I wanna say that through those stories, the stories that my grandmother told me, um, she introduced me to the idea of Appalachia as a place. And it was a place of working people, especially working women. In the late 1940s, my grandmother's husband and my grandfather, Leon, got a job as a pants presser in a garment factory. He would soon help to organize what I understand was the first amalgamated clothing workers local in Knoxville, Tennessee. And he would eventually join the amalgamated as a union organizer. Um, and I point this out because even though I grew up on the same old farm where he had lived as a child, I didn't really learn about his work until I was a graduate student. He had died when I was six years old and nobody really talked about his work or his commitments, even though his life and my grandmother's had revolved around the union for the majority of their adult lives. Once I learned about the union and I learned about his work, I broached the topic with my grandmother and it really like opened up vistas for us. And I learned about how important the union had been to her and how she had mourned the loss of that network of people after my grandfather died in the mid 1980s. After his death, she had returned to East Tennessee where anti-union politics dominated and where she felt like silence was the best option for her. And I think as we know all too well, that radical um, uh, history of the Southern working class has really been silenced over and over. Um, I know that my grandmother was often depressed, grieving both the loss of my grandfather and of her union friends. And really from that point on, I was determined to write about Southern working class history. Um, so I don't usually start talks with these personal anecdotes, but I thought tonight for this audience at the People's Forum, it made sense to explain how the stories that already lived inside me informed the kind of historian I chose to be and the sorts of questions I pursued. That's not to say that those foundational stories were unproblematic. Like many young white people from Appalachia who grew up in rural, predominantly white communities, I learned nothing of the history of settler colonialism and slavery or of the black working class that was so central to Appalachian history. Nor did I learn why and how the very idea of Appalachia was forged in whiteness, how elite white people in this country clamored to turn white rural people into the original Americans, um, always a symptom of nativism, classism, and white male supremacy, as well as a function of industrial capitalism. So while I came to working class in Appalachian history through my experience, I grew and expanded as a historian as I grappled with complexity, nuance, and diversity, especially in the history of social movements in Appalachia of the 1960s and 70s. When I started my book project, I knew I wanted to write about working class women in the Appalachian South. And honestly, there are hundreds of ways that I could have approached that. And there are hundreds of books yet to be written about those histories. But I found myself most drawn to materials I was finding in the archives about women in Eastern Kentucky, 
For instance, a scrapbook that one woman kept during the Brookside strike. Um, and then uh, the underground newsletter, newsletters that women wrote during the war on poverty. I also heard many stories about these women in oral history interviews. Um, so that's how I came to this particular project. Um, so before I discuss the book's interventions, let me say a little bit about misconceptions about Appalachia and um, the intersections of race, class, and gender. Um, so I'm gonna offer um, three points here. So first of all, historically, Appalachia has often stood in for a certain kind of whiteness. And of course, um, that assumption erases the black communities and indigenous communities that lived and continue to live in the region. This is important not only for recognizing diversity, it's important, I believe, because racial assumptions have had significant consequences for people of color in Appalachia. For instance, when the Appalachian War on Poverty was perceived as white, black working class communities among the poorest in the region found that they were excluded and often could not access the federal resources available to white people in Appalachia. Second, people in Appalachia were and uh, are you know, not uniquely racist, but neither is Appalachia a place of white racial innocence. And I often find you know, both of those ideas um, kind of uh, being pushed and, and both of them are, are really wrong. Um, so like the rest of the United States, the Mountain South has a long history of ethnic and racial oppression. White settlers terrorized and dispossessed Native Americans of land and many owned and traded enslaved Africans. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, whites led campaigns of violence and terror against freedmen. Um, white controlled state and local governments passed laws and ordinances that prevented the settlement of African Americans and often impeded their occupational mo mobility, patterns that existed well into the 20th century. Um, so these and other factors led to black outmigration in some areas of Appalachia, and that often gave the appearance of a white Appalachia. Um, and, um, and so in some, you know, while there may be places in Appalachia or just in this country that are predominantly white, whether it's um, a rural community or a suburb of Atlanta or a borough in New York City, you know, those uh, are part of active racist practices and policies. These communities aren't accidental. And the same is true in Appalachia. And then finally, the stock image of Appalachia was always steeped in gender. White men, the so-called mountaineers, and then the coal miner, who really became icons of the region, have embodied the place. That region has defined scholars and politicians alike have thought and written about the mountain south. The very concept Appalachia has been constructed around white men's experiences and has ignored gender dy dynamics in the region, especially those of working class and poor women. And so that brings me to the book that I wrote. And I'm gonna share some slides with you now. As I move on to um, some ideas, key ideas from the book. Um, so this is part two, where I'm gonna talk about some of the big ideas and then I'll move on to talking about some of the women that I write about. Um, so my book charts how working class white women in Eastern Kentucky and throughout Appalachia joined social movements of the 1960s and 70s. Um, from starting with the war on poverty to movements for labor, welfare, health, and women's rights. It documents how, through these campaigns, they exposed the harsh realities of life under coalfield capitalism, which was characterized by the concentration of power and wealth in the hands of mine owners, investors, and corporate coals executives, and how they sought to build robust working class solidarity. 
Um, and here's a map of the area of Appalachia that I write about. Um, you can see some of the towns in Eastern Kentucky that are a part of my study. Um, so I open the book with the story of activist Frances Granny Hager. Uh, Granny Hager was a young woman and midwife during the 1930s labor struggles, and she had participated in protests back then. By 1962, and she was older, she was married, um, and her husband, Ab, uh, was dying of coal miners' pneumoconiosis, and he had worked in the mines his entire life. Um, and, and coal miners' pneumoconiosis is black lung disease. At this point, the Hagers had lost their health insurance, and Granny Hager told a story in oral history interviews of rushing her husband to the hospital where they were turned away because they could not pay a $50 deposit. Granny Hager took Ab home and she sat with him and watched her husband slowly die. Months after Ab's death, Granny Hager partnered with a retired miner to organize what they called the roving pickets. Widows and retired miners traveled from mine to mine, urging workers to strike and force coal companies to improve working conditions. A few years later, Hager met anti-poverty workers as part of the war on poverty, who helped miners and widows like her to force the federal government and the coal industry to recognize the existence of black lung disease. After passage of federal legislation, Hager went door to door to inform people of their rights as workers. 10 years after Ab's death, Granny Hager was known around the region for her activism. In June 1972, she spoke at a union rally for Miners for Democracy, a grassroots movement of rank and file coal miners to reform the UMWA. The rally took place at the site of that previous labor struggle in 1931. During her 1972 speech, Granny Hager declared, quote, people say to me, well, Granny, why are you out working and doing this when you've got no kids, nobody but yourself? I said, yeah, but there are old people who need their minor's retirement pension. There are old people who need their social security. There are fathers who have died and left their little children and they need their black lung benefits. And if I can help one person that really needs it to get something to live on, I think it's worth all these here 40 years that I've been on the job. Central to her job of 40 years was a commitment to helping working class men and women understand and take advantage of their rights. So for me, Granny's, Granny Hager's life and activism exemplifies the fusion of an ethic of care with an ethos of citizenship. Hager was part of a tradition of Appalachian women's activism that linked the daily acts of sustaining life to democratic participation. So in my book, I show how activists in Eastern Kentucky and throughout Central Appalachia from the 1930s up through the 1970s drew on their social positions as caregivers as they articulated the goals of a multitude of grassroots campaigns. You may be asking yourself what exactly I mean when I say caregiving. And I'm drawing upon um, scholars' ideas about social reproduction or care work. These activities include raising, teaching, and socializing children, caring for the elderly and disabled, caring for oneself, preparing food, and maintaining ties of family and kin. And the majority of this care work, both paid and unpaid, has historically fallen to women. Caring labor sustains life and it also sustains the capitalist system. Yet, as the women I write about argued again and again, capitalist accumulation strained and threatened social reproduction. It cre created conditions in which care work became difficult, if not impossible to perform. My book asks us to consider what would it mean to center social reproduction when we discuss the meaning and value of labor? The women I'm going to discuss today help us to ponder these questions. So in my book, I assert that understanding the links between an ethics of care and an ethos of citizenship 
contributes to our understanding of 20th century US history. It reveals how vital the history of caregiving labor is to making sense of the histories of capitalism and labor in Appalachia. And I think now that we're in the era of COVID, this is um, sort of common sense. We understand how important care work is now if we didn't before. Um, my book also shows how the great society programs of the 1960s, despite limitations, created important openings for poor and working class women throughout Appalachia and the South to address the worst abuses of capitalism, leading to campaigns that address welfare rights, healthcare, and environmental justice. It offers new perspectives also on grassroots feminism, which emerged sporadically, addressed local concerns, and led women into crucial debates about the meaning of gender justice. Okay, so now I'm gonna move us into part three, and I'm going to take you on kind of a whirlwind tour of six moments within what was called the Appalachian Movement of the 1960s and, and late 1970s. Um, and the thread that will link all of these is the significance of care work to the actions and arguments of women like Granny Hager, who often led these movements. So I'm gonna start with the war on poverty. Let's see. Okay, so um, you can see pictured here, Edith Easterling and her husband, Jake. Um, and in 1964, Edith Easterling was a middle-aged mother of four. She was a cook at the school cafeteria and um, she was married to Jake Easterling who was a, a union coal miner who had been disabled in the mines. Edith had lived almost all of her life in one holler in Eastern Kentucky and she had long been involved in local politics. Her daughter, Suella, referred to her as the unofficial social worker in their community um, that was called Marabone Creek um, in Pike County. Um, when the war on poverty started, Edith was poised really to direct traffic. She had ideas about what the war on poverty should look like in her community. And primarily she saw it as a way to change politics as usual. She was soon hired as a paid organizer. And in that position, she helped to start the Marabone Folk School. And she's pictured here in the doorway. Um, the Marabone Folk School was based on the community education model of the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee. The volunteers claimed the mantle of what they called mountain people's power. And they described the school as a place where they would dispel the myth that poor people and mountain people were ignorant and apolitical. Participants in the school would concern themselves with the massive, quote, social, economic, and political problems of the poor class of people in the Appalachian South. Community members and activists met at the school to discuss politics, spread information about social services, hold health clinics, and organize against strip mining, for which they would soon face a swift backlash. For Edith, the war on poverty was a way to serve her community, building working people's power. And it was a way to work toward democratic participation in a place where the coal industry had controlled local and regional politics since the late 19th century. Um, fast forward a few years to 1968, when several hundred white and black people from Appalachia joined the Poor People's Campaign in Washington, DC. Martin Luther King Jr. had designed it before his assassination in order to bring together a multiracial movement of poor people who were by their definition, also always working people. Edith couldn't attend, but she supported it from afar while her daughter, Suella, raised money to help fund Appalachian activists who wanted to head to DC. Appalachian representatives also joined the Committee of 100 of the Poor People's Campaign, and they distributed an economic bill of rights drafted by civil rights activist Bayard Rustin. It called for more involvement of poor people in controlling federal anti-poverty programs 
and they demanded programs that led to access to jobs with a living wage, adequate income, land, and capital. A few weeks after the campaign ended, Edith organized a welfare rights information meeting in Eastern Kentucky. Community representatives came from surrounding communities and they gathered to meet with a staff person for the National Welfare Rights Organization invited by Edith. Um, the National Welfare Rights Organization, as probably many of you know, was founded by Black welfare rights activists and led by the bold organizer Johnny Tillman, pictured here with George Wiley. White and Black women in Appalachia also joined the organization, and they took cues from its leadership about campaigns. As they built welfare rights networks, community organizers in Appalachia described the importance of coalition building. They saw their movements um, as, or they saw their welfare rights movement as a quote, big net that would address the needs of single mothers, disabled minors, poor families, elderly people, and it would be multiracial, connecting with black lung and disability campaigns, poor people's movements and the labor movement. The welfare rights movement was fundamentally concerned with acknowledging and supporting the unpaid care work that largely fell to women. Soon after that initial meeting that Edith had organized, welfare rights organizations began to sprout up around Eastern Kentucky, Southwest Virginia and West Virginia led by local women. These groups worked to ease the burdens of poverty, especially for the women who took on the brunt of care work. They did so in three primary ways. First, they educated local people about their rights, as well as how to sign up for social security, disability, food stamps, or welfare for single mothers, which was called AFDC. In that process, they learned how to advocate for themselves and others and how to address racism and sexism that they experienced in the system. Second, they offered an analysis born from their own experiences about why poverty persisted in central Appalachia. A good example comes from the constitution of the Eastern Kentucky Welfare Rights Organization. Um, they stated, quote, we believe people are poor because in this generation or in the generation past, they have been denied equal opportunity to land. This happened when coal companies bought the land and mineral rights for as low as 50 cents an acre, even though they knew the true value. The results of this exist to the present day. The group argued that poverty was unforgivable in a resource rich nation. Third, women led efforts to implement legis legislation that would redistribute wealth and center the act of caregiving in policy. Um, this brings me to the story of Eula Hall, um, who passed away just a few weeks ago after a long life of fighting for poor and working people's rights. She was one of the fiercest leaders in the regional welfare rights movement. A mother of five from Eastern Kentucky, she found paid employment through the community action agencies that were part of the war on poverty in 1965. Um, she's, she was the daughter of tenant farmers. She had attended school for only five years before becoming a domestic worker. And she married at 15 um, and was caught in a really violent marriage with an abusive husband. Um, and, and as a young woman, she learned, and, and as a young mother, she learned that if she could get her husband committed to the veterans hospital for 50 days or more, she could draw public assistance from aid to families with dependent children or AFDC. Um, so, you know, those experiences really informed her when the war on poverty uh, came to Eastern Kentucky and she ended up joining War on Poverty programs in 1966. Um, soon after, she and her community identified welfare as a key issue that they should organize around. Um, they worked alongside college-aged men and women who volunteered in the War on Poverty. 
She also found allies in young activists who came to the region attracted to the militant labor history and the dream of interracial worker movements. Together, they traveled to Kentucky's capital and to Washington, DC, and they lobbied for funding to support poor people's organizing. Um, and uh, Eula was a part of that Eastern Kentucky Welfare Rights Organization. She was one of the leaders of it. And I wanted to just read a statement from her about how she described the significance of that organization. Um, she said, we wanted to organize just like a union. We wanted to have our own body, our own unity, so we could deal with problems we were faced with. And you know, we were stronger in groups than we were individuals and we had hundreds of members. So as the local movement expanded, um, the local welfare rights movement expanded, um, it, it met up with and intersected with welfare rights groups across the state and the country. The welfare rights groups representing Appalachia joined one of the biggest battles for welfare rights in the 20th century when they marched for a guaranteed income in Washington, D.C. in 1971. A year prior, President Nixon had proposed what he called the Family Assistance Plan. It would provide something along the lines of a universal basic income, and it seemed like it might finally dispel the stigma of welfare. But activists quickly realized that it would actually hurt most single women offering them less than they currently received. And it would tie welfare to work programs, again, meaning waged work, of course, not recognizing that uh, the unpaid work of many mothers um, was valuable. So when the family assistance plan was defeated and another plan did not replace it, activists were crushed. Um, but they would have no idea how that backlash um, that was beginning, that backlash to welfare and the great society, would soon stifle their arguments for welfare rights altogether. Indeed, that backlash was so strong and so vicious that it effectively wiped away the memory of the Appalachian welfare rights movement, as well as interracial organizing around welfare and caregiving labor. Um, for her part, Eula Hall returned home and she continued her activism on a local level. With a network of progressive doctors who had been trained in the civil rights movement and in alliance with the labor and anti-poverty movements, she helped to open one of the first Appalachian community health clinics in 1973. Its mission was to serve everyone, regardless of ability to pay, it also connected healthcare to labor, environmental, and social issues. Um, the delivery of healthcare was a central concern in the Great Society legislation, most notably in the creation of programs to finance care for the elderly through Medicare and poor families through Medicaid. Yet these programs did not address fundamental problems in the healthcare system for rural people in Appalachia, and that was that many of them lacked access to care because they lived far from hospitals. Others faced discrimination and racial sex and class barriers to care. So these advocates of community health sought to provide new models of care by opening neighborhood clinics where primary care and preventive services would be the focus along with building relationships with community members in order to address environmental and social concerns related to health. So these health activists envisioned healthcare as more than tending to individual bodies. It was the ability to see those bodies as part of a web of life, work, community, environment, and history. When community health emerged as a central concern, Activists like Eula Hall adopted a series of strategies to expose systemic health injustices. They spotlighted occupational disease and disability, expanded access to health care, joined movements to expose environmental hazards, and made visible the health impacts of gendered poverty. Um, so I hope like what's starting to become evident is how activists like Eula Hall and Edith, Edith Easterling traversed various movements 
you're picking up supporters along the way and building alliances. Um, so this brings me to the labor movement and the Brookside strike. Um, so uh, Eula Hall and other anti-poverty workers joined dozens of women on the picket lines during the Brookside strike of 1973 and 74 in Harlan County, Kentucky, of course made famous in the film Harlan County, USA. They supported the miners on strike to demand the company recognize a contract with the UMWA. But what I found is that they also linked the union campaign to arguments about care work in the coal fields. Um, to provide one example, Minnie Lunsford, the oldest woman to join the 1973 strike, explained how union benefits ease the burdens of caregiving. She explained her activism years later, quote, at Brookside, we weren't striking so much over wages as over benefits and safety. Uh, when the strike began, her husband was uh, very sick with black lung disease, and the two of them relied upon the UMWA Health and Retirement Fund for medical care. And so she said, I know what a union card is worth. It paid for my hip bone, it paid for my eye, and it would have paid for my husband if he'd had to go stay in the hospital. When we got his pension money, we took it and we fixed this little old shabby house so it would be warm for me and him. Lunsford described how during the strike, she tried her hardest to explain to strike breakers why the union was important beyond higher wages. She posed questions to them when they drove past the picket lines. She would say, quote, do you have a daddy or a granddaddy that's drawing black lung? Is he sick and unable to work? What do you think is gonna happen if you live that long and work at a non-union mine? She continued, quote, if you're crippled up in the mines and sitting in a wheelchair, do you think that company is going to take care of you? The subtext, of course, was that a family member, most likely a woman family member, would support them if they were unlucky enough to be injured in the mines or to wind up with black lung disease. And she would be better able to do that work with union benefits. So whether women were organizing for community health clinics or were picketing for minors on strike, by the 1970s, they often perceived their activism as part of a broader conversation about gender justice. And they linked their activism intergenerationally um, to other women activists across time. In 1975, Eula Hall, members of the Brookside Women's Club and anti-strip mining activists attended an International Women's Year event, the first major event hosted by the new Appalachian Women's Rights Organization. Now, this organization was all white or nearly all white as far as I can tell, but it did espouse ideas of feminism that sounded more like those of women of color feminisms that were emerging at the time. Feminists in Appalachia fought for a gender justice that centered caring labor the work of raising families and tending to community needs, fighting poverty, exposing the ills of capitalism. Their feminism focused on what they called survival and economic issues. By the late 1970s, as new policies, um, new feminist policies opened up formerly masculine workplaces to women, a woman donning coal miners garb became the new iconic image of the Appalachian feminist, kind of replacing the other feminists who had been more um, connected to the welfare rights movement. Those tra trailblazing women who entered the mines also fought for the rights of women caregivers. They exposed discrimination against pregnant women, they fought for safer workplaces, and they argued for paid family leave policies. And I would be happy to talk uh, more about them um, later in the Q&A if you're interested. But uh, I want to be conscious of the time here. So um, in closing, I hope it's become clear how my approach to working class history is to include types of activism that address social reproduction and care work, not only the class struggles that played out in workplaces, 
When women in the coal fields engaged in activism, their caring labor often formed an important backdrop for understanding what motivated them. And it's often been all too easy to think they were simply supporting husbands. They were standing by their men on picket lines or when they were defending striking minors. But the truth is that women often had their own motivations tied to their own labor. Their perspective often led them into activism for environmental justice, welfare rights, and gender equality, along with labor struggles tied to workplaces. In this story, working class white women in Appalachia, along with the multiracial throngs of women workers throughout the country and world, exposed the harsh limitations of a capitalist economy and argued for placing value on women's paid and unpaid care work, feeding children, caring for family members and overseeing the health of the community. In the era of COVID and essential workers, these histories are more vital than ever. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Jesse. This is a beautiful history. Um, and I'm sure a lot of us are in awe of these women from striking for unions on the coal fields to organizing around health and community care. And I know a lot of us are seeing the connections to um, quote unquote essential workers and the unpaid care work that is happening today um, as well. Um, just beautiful. Um, so the Q&A is now open for everybody to um, put in thoughts, to put in questions. Um, and we also have a couple of questions coming from the cohort of organizers, um, journalists, cultural workers who have read a few of the chapters beforehand. Um, so I'll start um, just specifically around uh, the Appalachian women. They saw themselves as workers. They saw their, their caring labor sustain capitalist accumulation and also strained it, that paradox, right? Um, so clearly they saw themselves as workers with something to withhold, um, mm -hmm. but they also faced a lot of um, violence um, and uh, like repressive repression um, withholding that. So how did they use their identities to both like propel the movement and also circumvent some of that violence that they experienced? Yeah, that's such a great question to hear. Um, and, and there are a few things to com that come to mind. So, you know, first I would say, um, you know, when, if we're thinking about the Brookside strike and I'll use that as an example, because it really galvanized uh, not just people in that community, but all these organizers um, who'd been doing this work for a decade um, and sometimes longer, you know, since the 1930s, really. And, and a lot of times the women would say, you know, we joined the picket lines initially because we could prevent violence because we're women. And, and this is something, of course, positioned as white women in this community, that they could say that because there's an assumption that um, white women in particular in the South are gonna be protected from violence. Now, what we also know is that's not true for working class women who are participating in a labor strike or who are challenging capital. And, and so while they believed that in some ways it would prevent certain kinds of violence like gunfights kind of happening out in the open, the, the truth is that they actually faced a lot of violence themselves. Um, sometimes they faced it in their own homes because their partners didn't really like that they were getting involved in activism, um, that they were kind of rupturing um, uh, notions of traditional gender. And then other times, uh, you know, they were experiencing violence on the picket lines. Um, they were manhandled and beaten by cops who were arresting, you know, people who, who were protesting, they were put into jail. Um, and, and then uh, some of them were targeted by the Klan um, who charged that they were involved in interracial relationships and, and that they were, um, uh, you know, basically they'd lost the protections of, of white womanhood. So on the one hand, they thought that being kind of white women in the South would protect them but the, the class element, the fact that they're working class women who were challenging the system took away those protections. And I, you know, I think that's, um, it's, it's interesting to think about how 
a certain identity mobilized them to get involved. And then it, that evolved over time and they came to understand how actually they weren't gonna be protected as, as women. And I think that really, um, that really made some of them much more militant when they realized that truth. Yeah, thank you. Ultimately, it's, their, it's the class that was um, weaponized against them. Um, mm -hmm. That actually um, speaks to one of the questions that came up in our group about uh, just in general, that narrative of what an Appalachian person is. Um, obviously, these women challenge that um, as women, as care workers on the picket line. But even now, and this is one of the questions in the Q&A, but even now there's a, there's a picture of the white male Appalachian person. Do you feel like that is that picture is weaponized at all to continue exploiting um, folks working there? Uh, do you think, like, how is that traced now? To today's times. Yeah, well, I so first of all, I would I would say that image of kind of like <laughs> we're thinking historically, it's the mountaineer, it's the quote unquote hillbilly, it's um, the coal miner more recently, um, and kind of defenses uh, def defenses of um, industrial capitalism, like using that image. I, I just think about that moment. I don't, you all will probably remember when Trump brought so-called coal miners up like on stage with him and they did a press conference and he signed some, some executive order, I think about maybe strip mining or the coal fields. I can't remember exactly, but the, the so-called coal miners beside him were actually coal operators. They were people from the coal industry kind of playing working class, like putting on the, putting a, on a performance of, of working class people to defend their own interests. So that, that comes to mind. But, you know, I would say um, you know, for people who are interested in like the history, the, these historical constructions of white masculinity um, as related to Appalachia, Anthony Harkins has really, I think the best book on this, it's called Hillbilly, A Cultural History. And I think one thing that he does, or a few things that he does really well is, is one, he shows how these images can be both positive and be simplistic, or they can be negative and also be very simplistic and damaging, but both of them are really harmful um, because they don't deal with like, the actual, you know, political economy and social system that people are living in. They're all kind of these made up caricatures. Um, and so we need to think about how those images come up in our culture, how they mutate over time and how we consume them and why they, they're perpetuated. Like what work is that doing in the world? And, and he shows how in the early 20th century um, through kind of the, the civil rights era, they're used um, to deal with racial anxieties that white kind of middle-class Americans or elite Americans are dealing with. And they um, kind of bizarrely <laughs> use, like create these images to address issues of uh, fears over immigration and nativism, um, fears about or concerns about the great migration as black Southerners are moving to, uh, and, and Black Southerners and poor whites are moving to um, cities in the Northeast and Midwest. And, and then to address um, the civil rights movement and, and racism in the country. And, and that happens strangely enough through the image of uh, so-called hillbillies. And so Anthony does a nice job of showing how these images have a history. They're not based in an actual place. They're not based on actual people but they do a lot of work in the world. So I would kind of point people to that, that work. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. The, the images that they perpetuate, uh, they stick in our, in our minds and they create a certain um, picture of what we, we, what we know. And I think that's relevant to why we're having the series in the first place um, of kind of relearning the way in which our uh, US history has been taught to us. So, um, you know, clearly labor and unionizing history of the South is critical to advance the working class struggle. Um, from, and, you know, in your point of view, why do you think it's been voided in our education and our understanding of U.S. history? 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, it depends on where you are, first of all, right? So, um, you know, as I opened the talk, I, I didn't learn my own family's history, my own family's involvement in the labor movement and and labor history. And, um, you know, I think that's, you know, that's connected to the kind of, um, I think some of the failures that people experienced or they were let down um, by some of these movements and, and then kind of uh, were sold an idea, at least in, in East Tennessee and I think you know, throughout the South that um, if they wanted a job, they better not deal with unions at all. And, and people who are so desperate for work. And I mean, I think we've even kind of heard that in, you know, in more recent, um, more recent uh, labor campaigns in the South, that there's a lot of fear. Um, I've organized uh, on a, a university campus in Mississippi, we organized United Campus Workers. And, and, you know, when that's the best job, so if you're, if you're a facilities worker or a custodial worker, getting a job at the university is the best job you can get. It pays $10 an hour, but you get benefits and, you know, your kids might be able to go to that university for a reduced price. So the, the stakes are really high for people. And so I think, you know, in those places, um, that history, of course, has been eliminated to, you know, keep people from being radicalized, but also plays on fears that people already had. Um, and then I think, you know, when we're thinking more broadly and nationally, I think there's a tendency to believe that the South is where all the worst things about the country um, come from, or like that's where, um, that's how to make sense of them. It's kind of this big container for um, bad stuff and, and for the worst parts of our history. And, and that, again, serves a real purpose in the kinds of national narratives that we tell. So if you start talking about progressive movements in the South, other than, you know, people kind of accept the civil rights movement, but right, that story is there are people from other places going to the South to support the movement. So there's a way of kind of explaining why it becomes successful that decenters Black Southerners. Um, but you know, I think if you start talking about this longer history, then the South um, doesn't, doesn't necessarily uh, serve the narrative, that broader national narrative uh, that so many people have, including, you know, I think so, a lot of liberal um, Americans hold as well, um, not just uh, people on the right wing or people who are conservative. Um, you know, when I, um, was in living in Cambridge, Massachusetts when the book Hillbilly Elegy came out, which is a real narrative of culture of poverty and, and blaming people for their own, um, you know, their, their own poverty or, or class status or um, struggles in life. And, and that book was, I mean, that's, Cambridge is the most liberal city in the US or at least one of them. And, and that book was flying off the shelves. People really loved to consume that narrative. It kind of matches what they already believe about the South and Appalachia. Sorry, I'm getting kind of swallowed up by, by the light coming into my window. <laughs> I'll try to move. Got it. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm, I'm interested to learn a little bit more about the interracial coalitions that um, the Appalachian women were forming, um, knowing that it, it wasn't 100% that there, were, there was a lot of it. Um, just what kinds of political education were the women bringing to the picket lines, bringing to their meetings? Um, you, you touched on a lot of that political education, mm -hmm. cutting off for social security, um, like naming the poverty and where it's coming from unequal opportunities to land, that kind of thing. So, so what were they doing around race and, and how did that, how was that addressed? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, until recently with um, the, the current day Poor People's Campaign, again, that, that was a moment in history that I think had been de-emphasized or kind of overlooked. And, and which is unfortunate because that was a really powerful moment for a lot of people, especially a lot of working class white people 
who could see themselves, um, you know, in, in alliances and building coalitions with the civil rights movement and in particular with, with working class black people and, and to see themselves as having, um, you know, similar struggles. And, and so, yeah, I didn't mention it in the, the talk, but in West Virginia, in Charleston, West Virginia, the organizers of the Poor People's Campaign, including um, Andrew Young, who had uh, become the director of the SCLC after King, you know, they, they came to Charleston and they had this big meeting and 500 people showed up to this meeting and it was covered in, in all the local papers and in the underground papers. And, and, you know, it was covered in a, like people were really excited about these connections, interconnections. And um, I think there was a lot of promise there. Um, you know, so, so that was happening, um, but on a more kind of um, you know, grassroots level, uh, you know, people were educating themselves about what was happening around the country. And so when I say that um, the Appalachian welfare rights movement was kind of modeling itself and, and taking or, or borrowing ideas from the National Welfare Rights Organization, what I mean is that they were studying what you know, mostly black women were doing in other places. They were meeting with them in Lexington, Kentucky, and, and they were coming up with platforms together. And, um, and then Appalachian youth had, uh, there's one group who had a, a, an underground newspaper. You know, these underground newspapers were incredible. Like they, they did so much political education in those papers and they would write about what was happening. You know, when Chicano, uh, Chicanx students went on, uh, when they walked out of school in the 60s, uh, the late 60s, they were doing writing about um, black women organizing in various cities across the country. Um, if there was a march, they were going to write about it. And they were writing about the issues that people were fighting about and finding common ground. So I think, you know, often there's this image of people in Appalachia as kind of cut off from the rest of the country and cut off from what's going on in the world. Um, you know, even, um, yeah, I mentioned Eula Hall passed a couple of weeks ago. The major, the obituaries for her in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times make it sound as though she was just an individual lone person interested in healthcare and helping poor people. And they totally write off the movements that she was part of. Um, so, you know, I think um, that I'm giving you kind of a rambling answer at this point, but, but you know, it was happening in a lot of different ways. Um, it was happening with major organizations paying attention to Appalachia. It was happening at the grassroots level with organizations like the Marrowbone Folk School and other community centers where people gathered. It was happening in UMWA locals, right? Those local spaces, like, like, like the People's Forum, right? Those are so vital for doing that kind of work and for people to be able to communicate what's happening in their own communities, but also to make connections at the you know, regional, national and international level. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And um, definitely the erasure of Eula Hall's true legacy in the paper um, speaks to a little bit of the way we were taught in our education too, right? Like, right. She, the individualist nature of it. She's not really part of a movement. Um, and it's like a much easier way to digest the actually radical work that she mm -hmm. did um, building these interracial coalitions. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, I, and I think that does take me to like present day today, right? What does mm -hmm. the genuinely radical history of Southern organizing? So these Appalachian women, um, uh, what are they, what does this reveal about what's happening now from um, in Alabama for Bessemer, Alabama? Um, to the PRO Act in West Virginia. Are you seeing any connections? I know you mentioned the teacher strike earlier, but mm -hmm. there's organizing struggles happening right now. Yeah, I, you know, I think um, the, you know, I see the, the, with my own work, the clearest kind of link is between um, your women organizing in Appalachia in the past um, and the teachers who, you know, of course, um, in West Virginia, uh, the 55 Strong Movement, um, when teachers went out on strike in 2018. And, and theirs was a fight for the common good. And, and that's really, you know, the women I write about, that's ultimately 
what they're fighting for is the common good, you know, defending um, uh, or, or trying to create access to public spaces and public goods. And, and teachers, of course, are, are really um, at the forefront of, of, of that movement today. Um, and, you know, and I think um, also um, we can see connections today. I'll, you know, I, I know some hospital workers are organizing, not necessarily so much in, in Appalachia, um, although, you know, correct me anyone if I'm, if I'm missing something or wrong about that. But, you know, I think that's an area where hopefully we see more organizing because um, healthcare work, and this is something that um, Gabriel Wynett covers in his new book, The Next Shift, um, which is a really, really important book about how uh, the healthcare industry replaces industrial work you know, like steel work and, and coal mining. And, and that's what we see in a lot of Appalachian communities is it's not that there aren't jobs. It, it's that the, the highest paying jobs, which were coal jobs and steel jobs and other, you know, industrial work, blue collar work, um, that has declined. And we've seen the rise of healthcare services and other social services. We just don't pay those workers, what we paid blue collar workers, but we could fix that. That work is, is valuable and, and those folks should be making a living wage and, and, and more. I mean, their work should be valued as much as, as blue collar work. So I think you know, that's an important link to the present. And, and I think it's just gonna grow in importance um, given, given what we've experienced this past year. Um, and you know, I'll just say on the, the legislation, um, the PRO Act, um, or you know, for those who, who don't know much about it, Protecting the Right to Organize Act, which has passed the House, we'll see if it makes it through the Senate. But you know, that legislation would restore workers' rights to organize um, by uh, allowing unions to collect dues and overriding right to work laws and um, would comment uh, or, or curb union busting practices. Um, it would be the biggest piece of labor legislation since the New Deal. Um, and I think uh, that it's really important and we need to do, you know, we, we need to be putting a lot of pressure on our senators um, and, and, and really be organizing around this legislation. And I think, you know, for my own work, I can see how much federal policies really mattered. And I will say this, um, the women that I wrote about were, many of them were not very well, um, they had not gotten formal education. They were very educated on their own terms by their own work, but they did not, you know, they, they didn't go to high school, they didn't go to college. Uh, many of them, but they really, they, un they read legislation, they understood legislation, they were in DC constantly, they were in their state capitals constantly, they were organizing people and getting them, you know, to those, the halls of Congress and, and to these, the places where people of power, people in power make decisions. And, and they knew that these policies, these kinds of legislation would have a big impact on their lives. And, and sometimes I think, We've lost that a little bit um, because we have many people, including on the left, are very frustrated with politics and with our political leaders. And, and I understand that. They didn't have it much better though. And they still did that work on the ground and really pushed people who, let's face it, like their job is to serve the people. And they really took that for granted. And, and I think that's something that we would do well to remember often is that, um, you know, they are supposed to serve us. <laughs> they are supposed to serve the common good. So what if we started from that position like these women so often did and then, and then push and, and fight for um, policies that really benefit working people? Thank you so much, Jesse. That was um, a great, tie into that and there's actually like there's a win uh in the chat uh that mission hospital nurses unionized in Asheville and I love oh what? that is wonderful <laughs> I'm so glad to hear it I'm gonna have to look look that up cool uh it's always good to point out those wins um okay so we're getting to the end here but we still have a couple of more threads of conversation 
sorry about the ice cream truck, summertime. <laughs> um, this has come up a couple of times, um, if you wanted to touch on it a little bit. Um, how has, um, I guess, um, I guess Trump's language and his kind of politics, how has it impacted the mental terrain of now Appalachian South? Uh, and, and I guess maybe women's organizing there now. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a really, um, so here, here's what I'll say. I, I think like maybe a premise of the question is that Trump and his um, rhetoric and his ideologies, or I don't even know if we can give him a coherent ideology, um, what had a unique or distinctive impact in the Appalachian South. And I'm not sure that's the case. You know, I, I just, um, I mean, I think from what we know about say the January 6th insurrection, I mean, people were coming from the West Coast, they were coming from Michigan, they were coming from, yeah, some came from West Virginia, they came from all over. They, some of them were incredibly wealthy, some of them not so much. Um, and, and so, um, so I would just say that to start, like, I'm not sure there's a, there's a distinctive, um, uh, impact or, or kind of, um, way that, that Trump kind of, like his, his rhetoric courses through these places. Now, what I will say is where I have most noticed, um, like really, um, much of the many of the like Trump signs and kind of like homemade signs right, where people are really um, seem really invested in Trump's image are often in in towns where um, they've been depopulated. There's very little for young people to do. So they, they leave. Um, the people who have remained are older. They are sicker than the average population. Um, these are predominantly white communities who may feel like they have lost something. Um, and, and so there is, there are pockets of, of that. And, and I would imagine there are pockets of those kinds of communities, you know, across, again, across the country. And that looks different than the kind of, you know, whatever Trump supporter who came in on a private jet to go to the, the insurrection. So, um, you know, and, and as a historian, like I think you can probably tell I'm often uncomfortable with these kinds of questions because I, I like to have some distance from things to, to make sense of them. But, you know, as a person living in the region, you know, that's, that's what I would say my own kind of experience is. Um, and, and so you see those pockets of communities um, and then you see, um, you know, some of the hardest fought battles at, at the same time. So, you know, both of those things are happening at once. Um, and then, it, of course, it is true that uh, in places like West Virginia, um, Trump won handily. Um, he also won in places like where I'm from in East Tennessee, which has been a Republican stronghold way before Trump. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that it's just like all about Trump. I think, I think there's been a longer, there's something, a longer history at play here that we, have to make sense of. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse, for giving us that context. And yes, definitely um, holding it into uh, it is all Trump is what kind of uh, sections off our movement when that's not the reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, okay. I, ha I have a very specific historical question for you um, from one of our comrades who read the, the chapters um, and also you mentioned it today. Um, and then we'll end with one more question around archiving this. Okay, so what was the curriculum or the methods of pedagogy employed by uh, Malloy and Edith Easterling within the Marrow Bone Folk School? Mm. Um, and was there collaboration with the attendees of the classes that informed the overall political education being taught within the school? Yeah, so um, that's such a good question. And I think, um, the, 
you know, from what I know about the Marabone Folk School, like I said, is it's modeled after the Highlander Research and Education Center. So based in people's experience so that, that um, you know, it's not necessarily always reading a text that's the most important thing about learning how our society works or learning about the political economy, but it's about being in a room, sharing your experiences and, and making those connections based in, in that experience. And, and of course, these, these women and, and men had a lot to draw upon. I mean, they, they had seen, their families had seen the transition from uh, those regions of, of, of Appalachia being predominantly agricultural to becoming the coal fields. They had seen the rise of mechanization. They had seen um, the beginnings of strip mining and they were protesting that. Um, many of them, you know, most of them that, that I wrote about had come from strong UMWA families. And they talk about the kitchen table. They talk about the conversations that their families had. Um, so, um, you know, it's a community education model in that sense, but they were also collecting um, books and pamphlets and newsletters because they felt like they had been denied Appalachian history. And, and so they wanted to create a library or kind of an archive to help, um, help people relearn Appalachian history from the perspective of regular people, you know, working people in the region. Um, so, so that's something else that they did. And they had a cultural piece to it. And um, they also learned kind of traditional music. They would bring in musicians to give lessons. Um, they would have dances um, and things like that. They would have quilting bees. So there was also this appreciation for the culture that um, they saw as rooted in their own families in Appalachia. Um, so, you know, very experiential, uh, really based on a popular education model. Wonderful. And I think that'll be really helpful for those of us who are educators in the cohort uh, reading this text. So thanks for sharing that. Um, and I think this last question speaks a little bit uh, to the archiving. Um, so for folks who have a white Appalachian working class background, um, like yourself, uh, do you have suggestions for how folks can find out more about their family and their roles? These kinds of things can perhaps help in having conversations at the dinner table, things like that. Um, what was your process and you have any suggestions? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, the a big thing is is asking questions. I think sometimes when we're in, you know, when we're we're in our families and we um, we just take for granted, or maybe the some of the older people take for granted that we might know these histories, and um, or maybe that that we're not interested, and so asking the older folks in our communities to tell us some stories. I mean, it can be a little awkward, but I, I, that's what I do. <laughs> so I'm an oral historian. I record interviews. Um, I've done that with family. I did that to write this book. Um, and, and I think um, people really like to be asked about their lives. Um, and, and often, uh, you know, I would say even like we, we have some idea of people's politics uh, based on who they vote for. But then when you sit down with someone and you have a conversation about the work that they did or that their parents did in their, their families, um, what their experiences were, um, that you know actions tell you a lot more about like where people come from, what they believe and why they believe it. Um, so, so that's a big one. And for me, it was, you know, asking my grandmother about her and my grandfather's work led her, I mean, she had boxes of stuff. She had kept all these pamphlets and workbooks and photographs um, of the work that they were doing in the South in the 1950s and, and beyond. Um, and so sometimes it's just asking that question, but, you know, in terms of, um, if that doesn't get you anywhere, I mean, there's some great archives, um, on Southern labor history. The Georgia state archives is probably the best on working class history. Um, and, and then, um, if it's, you know, Appalachian history, almost all of the universities like here at WVU, where I work, University of Kentucky, Berea college, lots of community colleges, they have these small collections and sometimes big collections that document this history 
Um, so it may, you know, you may find um, stuff there as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, and I hope that you were able to take note of that uh, to the folks who asked that question. Um, well, thank you so much, Jesse. You have given us so much uh, context. We've, we've learned a lot about the labor struggles of these women were inspired. Um, and we've learned about uh, the ways in which our history learning of that has been obscured and how we can kind of circumvent that through asking questions at the dinner table, through oral history, through relearning and engaging in these conversations with people such as yourself, um, scholars embedded in knowing about that labor struggle. And now we can have that conversation with organizers and really like bridge that gap. So appreciate it so much. Um, and opening it back up to you, is there anything else that you'd want to share with folks who are on the call today? No, I just want to say thank you again for having me to hear in the People's Forum. Um, and if anyone has questions, um, you know, my website is um, jessicawilkerson.org, or you can find me at West Virginia University. And, you know, if you have any other follow-up questions or things you want to share, I love hearing from people about this stuff. Um, and, and so, yeah, just again, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, we'll definitely be in touch. And thank you to everyone on the call today. Um, and this video will be available as a recording on our YouTube. So you can share that out to folks who weren't able to make it today. Um, and our next uh, session will be in June on the Round Valley Indians on work, community, and memory. Um, and you can find that on peoplesforum.org. Um, you can RSVP for that public talk. But with that, we'll close off today. Thank you so much all and have a great night.